Madam President, I rise to strongly support the Senator from Alaska and the Senator from Louisiana and the Senator from Mississippi. We should pay our Post Guard. Coast. It is not right that we aren't paying the Coast Guard. Right now, every other military branch is being paid. The Army's being paid, the Navy's being paid, the Air Force is being paid, the Marines are being paid, but the Coast Guard is not being paid, even as they're risking their lives. Many of us in Texas and along the Gulf Coast saw the incredible heroism of the Coast Guard in the wake of Hurricane Harvey, where so many brave men and women risked their lives to save thousands upon thousands of innocents. They should be paid. And Madam President, I think it's important for the American people to understand what just happened here because it is highly consequential. It is easy for things to get lost in procedural gobbledygook. To assume, well, this is some back and forth about the shutdown, about the wall, it has nothing to do with any of that. What Senator Kennedy asked, he brought forward a bill to pay the Coast Guard. It did nothing else. Didn't address any aspect of the shutdown, didn't address any aspect of the wall. It simply said, let's pay the men and women of the Coast Guard, yes or no. That means you can be a yes on that, whether you think we need to secure the border and have a steel barrier or whether you support open borders, it doesn't say anything either way. It just says the men and women of the Coast Guard deserve paychecks. We could have passed that right here today, and there's one reason and one reason only we didn't, because the Democratic leaders stood up and said, I object. And I would note that if there are Democrats on the Democratic side of the aisle that are not comfortable with that, who agree that the Coast Guard should be paid, let me encourage my Democratic colleagues to say so because it is their party's leader who has lodged an objection on behalf of effectively every Democratic senator. And what they are doing, the Democrats are fond of using the phrase hostage taking. They are quite literally holding the men and women of the Coast Guard hostage because they want to win a political victory against the president. Their objective here is have the president back down and have not a single mile of border wall built. Never mind that the Democratic leader and every Democrat in this chamber in 2013 voted to build and fund 350 miles of border wall. 350 miles every Democrat in this chamber voted for. We're in a shutdown today because they are now unwilling to fund 234 miles of border wall, less than they voted for in 2013. Now, we understand politics rears its head in this business, and the Democrats want to defeat the president politically, and so the substance is secondary to trying to get that partisan victory over the president. But let me suggest this ought to be an issue. We can keep fighting back and forth on whether securing the border or having open borders is a good idea. But this ought to be an issue that should be real simple. Senator Kennedy brought forward a clean bill that does one thing and one thing only. It pays the salaries of the Coast Guard. If the Democratic leader hadn't objected, that would have passed right now. The president could have signed it tonight. The paychecks could have gone out right now for every man and woman in the Coast Guard. So if you're serving in the Coast Guard, in any of our 50 states, let me say, number one, thank you for your service. Thank you for your heroism. Thank you for the amazing difference you make. You deserve to be paid. You will be paid. But if you want to know why you weren't paid, it is because the Democratic leader objected to your getting a paycheck. It is my hope that the Democratic senators will go to their leader and say, this is a bad idea for Democratic senators to hold hostage the paychecks of the men and women of the Coast Guard. We should pay the Coast Guard, and that ought to be something that commands unanimous bipartisan support. I yield the floor. Madam President. Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Madam President, just uh, to, to make one other point after the eloquent comments of my good friend from Texas, we've already done something similar here. So again, my plea to my colleagues, 
We're all breaking for lunch right now. My Democratic colleagues are going to go do their strategy session, and we're doing the same. I would implore them to go back to their leader and say, hey, come on, let's, let's rethink this, because here's why. We've already done something similar. I was on the floor when two of my Democratic colleagues from Virginia asked for unanimous consent on a bill. Now remember, the, the, the whole government was partially shut down. There was a partial government shutdown. They had asked for unanimous consent on a bill to make sure that when the partial government shutdown was over, that everybody would receive back pay. So we're actually doing work on smaller but very important issues. I was on the floor when they did that. I certainly voted yes. And by the way, that went to the president. He said he was going to sign it, and he signed it. So that became a law just about two weeks ago as we've been debating and trying to find compromise. So the notion that we're not doing any work, that we're not passing any laws that are impacting federal workers until the whole thing is over, that's actually not true. We've already done it. So this would be analogous to what we did two weeks ago, and that was led by the Democrats. And the thing about this Coast Guard bill right now is very, very bipartisan. Would the senator from Alaska yield for a question? Yes. Did the bill that Senator Kennedy brought forward do anything, anything else beyond simply pay the men and women of the Coast Guard? No. It just made it so there was parity between the brave men and women in the Coast Guard and the brave men and women in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, all of whom are risking their lives for our country and our citizens right now. Men and women of the Coast Guard are the only ones not getting paid. And so if the Democrats had not objected, and it had passed, and the House passed it and sent to the President, could, could we get the men and women of the Coast Guard paid right now, today, get that passed into law? I think we, as soon as possible we could get it passed. And I talked to the President on Wednesday, he said he was 100% behind this bill, the way he was behind that other bill, to, to provide back pay to everybody else who... Uh, has been affected by the partial government shutdown. So the only thing that is necessary to pass a clean bill paying the salaries of every man and woman in the Coast Guard is for the Democratic senators to withdraw their objection. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Madam President. Senator from Colorado. Madam President, I seldom, um, as you know, uh, rise on this floor to contradict somebody on the other side. I've worked very hard over the years to work in a bipartisan way with the presiding officer, with my Republican colleagues, but these crocodile tears that the senator from Texas is crying for first responders are too hard for me to take. They're too hard for me to take. Because when, you sh when the senator from Texas shut this government down in 2013, my state was flooded. It was underwater. People were killed. People's houses were destroyed. Their small businesses were ruined forever. And because of the senator from Texas, this government was shut down for politics. Then he surfed to a second place finish in the Iowa caucuses. But we're of no help. to the first responders, to the teachers, to the students whose schools were closed with the federal government that was shut down because of the junior senator from Texas. Now, it's his business, not my business, why he supports a president who wants to erect a medieval barrier on the border of Texas, who wants to use eminent domain to build that wall, who wants to declare an unconstitutional emergency to build that wall? That's the business of the senator from Texas. I can assure you that in Colorado, if a president said he was going to use eminent domain to erect a barrier across the state of Colorado, across the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, he was going to steal the property of our farmers and ranchers to build his medieval wall, there wouldn't be an elected leader from our state that would support that idea. 
Which goes to my final point, how ludicrous it is that this government is shut down over a promise the President of the United States couldn't keep. And that America is not interested in having him keep. This idea that he was going to build a medieval wall across the southern border of Texas, take it from the farmers and ranchers that were there, and have the Mexicans pay for it, isn't true. That's why we're here. Because he's now saying the taxpayers have to pay for it. That's not what he said during his campaign. Over and over and over and over again, he said, the Mex Mexico would pay for the wall. Over and over again. That was that. I was going to talk about what he said about the junior senator's father, but I'm going to let that alone. It was after that. And now we're here with the government shut down over his broken promise while the Chinese are landing spacecraft on the dark side of the moon. That's what they're doing. Not to mention what they're doing in Latin America and with their One Belt, One Road initiative in, in, in Asia. That's what they're doing while we're shut down over a promise he never thought he could, he would never keep and didn't keep. And finally, this idea that, I'm sorry to say, my colleague from Texas, and I, and I respect him, he's obviously a very intelligent person, but this idea that Democrats are for open borders is gibberish. And it is proven by what the senator from Louisiana said which is that time after time, we have supported real border security. Not a wall that gets, that, that the Mexico pays for, that gets you attentions at campaign rallies from, from some people in America, and, and it gets talked about on you know, Fox News at night. In 2013, Senator from Texas didn't support it, I did, in 2013, we passed a bill here in a bipartisan way. It got 68 votes. It had $46 billion in border security in it. 46! Not five billion for his rinky-dink wall he's talking about building. $46 billion of border security. It had, to be precise about it, 350 miles of what the president now refers to as steel slats. By the way, America, do you hear him not calling it a wall anymore? Now it's steel slats. Now it's a, a border barrier. 350 miles of so-called steel slats was in that bill. You know what else was in that bill? I think, Madam President, I believe you voted for that bill. I'll tell you what else was in that bill. We doubled the number of border security agents on that border. They could practically hold hands on the border. There were so many border security agents in that bill. We had billions of dollars of drone technology so that we could learn from what we've uh, learned in Afghanistan and other places and see every single inch of that border. Every inch. We had internal security in that bill so that small businesses and farmers and ranchers don't have to be the immigration police. So that finally in America, we can actually know who came here legally on a visa but overstayed their visa because 40% of the people in this country that are undocumented are here who came legally and overstayed. We still can't do that in America. Because that bill passed the Senate, but it couldn't get a vote in the House because of the stupidest rule ever created called the Hastert Rule. Named after somebody who's in prison. That has, that has, that has allowed 
a minority of tyrants in the Congress to bring a Democratic president low, President Obama, who they didn't let do anything, <clears throat> and to ruin the speakership of John Boehner, and to allow Paul Ryan to almost accomplish nothing while he was speaker except leaving this place in a government shutdown. The so-called Freedom Caucus. And the so-called Freedom Caucus has had a veto around this place for 10 years, Madam President. Completely distorted the Republican Party here. If I do say so myself, that may sound presumptuous, but I know a lot of Republicans in Colorado who don't agree with almost anything or anything that the Freedom Caucus has stood for. Yet they have had a veto on, on, on good bipartisan legislation passed uh, by the United States Senate. So I'm not going to stand here and take it from somebody who shut the government down while my state was flooded, or from a president who's saying he wants $5 billion to build some antiquated medieval wall that he said Mexico would pay for, when I helped write and voted for a bill that actually would have secured the border of the United States of America. that would have secured our internal defenses as well. This is a joke. And the fact that it consumes, you know, the cable networks all night, every night, and all the rest of it, this government should be open. We can debate whatever it is we want to debate. Do you think that the Chinese don't know that we can't land a spaceship on the dark side of the moon? Do you think the Russians don't know that for the first time since John Glenn was sent up <clears throat> to orbit this planet, America cannot put a person into space without asking the Russians to do it? Do you think the rest of the world doesn't know that we're not investing in our infrastructure? That we're not investing in the young generation of Americans? That we're willing to lose the race for artificial intelligence to the Chinese? That we're gonna break all of our long-standing alliances since World War II at a moment when China is rising? The Chinese China, China's GDP has quadrupled since 2001, tripled since 2003, doubled since 2009. Do, do, do we think that no one in the rest of the world knows all of that about us? We should reopen this government, Madam President, today. We should open it today. And then what I hope much more than that is that I, we actually come together to figure out how we're gonna govern this country again and stop playing petty partisan politics that are gonna do nothing to educate the next generation of Americans. That are gonna do nothing to fix the fiscal condition of this country for 10 years. For 10 years, Madam President, I've heard the junior senator from Texas, I've heard the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives talk about how important it is to get the fiscal condition of our government fixed. In fact, that's been the pretext for shutdowns and for fiscal cliffs and for, for all this stuff that does nothing but denigrate our democratic republic. And now, Madam President, for the first time almost in history, it happened once before in Viet during the Vietnam War,
for the first time almost in history, we are actually having our deficit shooting through the roof while unemployment is falling. Never happened before. And these are the people who called Barack Obama a Bolshevik and a socialist and at the depths of the recession when, when we had a 10% unemployment rate, didn't lift a finger to do anything. They have now given us a fiscal condition where our deficit is going up while our unemployment rate is falling. Do you know how hard, Madam President, it is to accomplish that? Do you know how irresponsible you would have to be to accomplish that? Yet, that's what's been accomplished. When I was first here, it was actually a little after I was first here, I used to walk through Denver International Airport, which we're very proud of in Colorado. By the way, it is the most recent airport that's been constructed in America. While we've been closed, other airports around the world, new airports have been open. Just, just while we've been closed. So, so Denver International Airport is the most recent airport in the country to be open. It was open 25 years ago, a quarter of a century ago. And during moments like when the senator from Texas shut the government down while Colorado was underneath floods and people had lost all the things that I talked about earlier, their houses, their jobs, and their lives, I used to want to walk through that airport with a paper bag over my head because I was so embarrassed to be part of this. And I often wondered, Madam President, why anyone would, in their right mind, want to work in a place that has a 9% approval rate. In fact, I brought out a chart, two charts one day to the floor, one that showed that we hadn't always had the 9% approval rating to remind people how far we had fallen in, in the public's estimation over the time that the senator from Texas and I have been here. Uh, and then I brought another chart out that, that looked at who else has a 9% approval rating. And I can't remember all that it. it's sort of been lost in the midst of time, but I do remember that the uh, IRS had a 40% approval rating. Um, uh, there was an actress, uh, uh, who had a 13% approval rating. More people wanted America to be a communist country, 11% than approved of this country. And Fidel Castro had a 5% approval rating, which was lower than our 9% approval rating. He was the only one who had a lower rating than that. And so my question often was, why would anybody want to work in a place that has such a low approval rating? And why would they want to behave in a way that only made matters worse. And I'm sorry to say this, Madam President, but there is an answer. If you think you have been sent here to dismantle the federal government, which I have lots of problems with, this federal government, I don't think it does a lot of things very well. And as a Westerner, I certainly believe we need to not be in the business of defending bad government, we need to be improving the government. But if you think your job is to dismantle it, as the Freedom Caucus does, in my view, then a 9% approval rating suits you just fine, because you get to go home and say, see how terrible all those guys are? See what idiots all those guys are? While you're taking your pay, while the federal workers are not getting paid, while you're keeping your job, while they're losing their job. And there has been an effort, not just to dismantle the federal government, but to separate it from the American people. To claim that it's someone else's, or that because it's corrupt, and in many ways I think it is, I believe it is. I believe this place is one of the most corrupt parts of the whole thing.
but because it's corrupt or because it can't get its act together or because uh, it's too far away from the people or because I think I would say because it's populated by a bunch of self-interested politicians who don't care about the priorities of the American people. But whatever the reason is, it's not separate. It is not separate. And the reason that's important is that we live in a democratic republic. And the founders of this country, who did two things that had never happened in human history, they led a successful armed insurrection against a colonial power in one generation. And they formed a democratic republic whose constitution was ratified by the people who would live under it. And what they knew, because they were Enlightenment thinkers, or I should say not what they knew, what they believed, because they had only bad examples from which to draw when they sat there in Philadelphia writing that Constitution. But what they knew was, in a republic, we would have disagreements. That was their expectation. And their belief was that out of those disagreements, we would for, and by the way, they knew we'd have disagreements because they had disagreements. And they failed on some very important things, it has to be said. They perpetuated human slavery because they couldn't come to an agreement about that. And other people who I think of as founders just as important, just as significant, as those founders ended the enslavement of human beings in America and did other important things, like make sure my daughters had the right to vote. Those people also are founders. But what they believed at their core was that through our disagreements, we would forge more imaginative and more durable solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. That was their belief. That was their expectation. And I would say our country, in many ways, has eclipsed any expectation they ever had of what America would become. For the moment, we're the richest country in the world. We have the greatest capacity for self-defense of any human population in the history of the world. We are far more democratic and far more free with all of our imperfections than they would have ever imagined and probably than most of them would have ever wanted. We are the longest lived democracy in human history. But for some reason, th there is a generation of politicians in America today who don't think it's necessary to live up to the standard that they set, and that the standard lots of other people have set from the founding of our country 230 years ago until today. I don't even know what day it is anymore of this, this record-long shutdown. But the pretext for it is an invention. It's a creation of something in the president's mind. It was something we've learned from reading the press. There was a mnemonic de uh, device used during the campaign to remind him to talk about immigration in, a, in an effort to divide Americans from one another instead of in an effort to bring us together. In an effort to turn what just three years ago was a bipartisan issue in the, the Senate securing our 
southern border with $46 billion into a cudgel to be wielded at campaign rallies. And in any case, the least we could do while we have these shabby disagreements that aren't worthy of our predecessors, are not worthy of the state I represent, which is a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third Independent, are threatening to make our generation the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity, not more, to the people coming after us. A generation of politicians who are openly suggesting that America's role in the world should be diminished. The least we could do is reopen our government and stop pursuing the self-inflicted harm that it creates to have hundreds of thousands of federal workers out of work and not being paid, not able to support their families, while we continue to stand on this floor having mindless arguments that are going to do nothing to advance the future of our country. We shouldn't shut the government down, as it has been in this case, for an, a campaign promise that the President, I'm sure, knew he could never keep. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Texas. Madam President, there's an old saying among Texas trial lawyers. If you have the facts, you bang the facts. If you have the law, you bang the law. If you don't have either one, you bang the table. We've seen a whole lot of table banging right here on this floor. The senator from Colorado spent a great deal of time yelling, spent a great deal of time attacking me personally. He did at one point briefly rise to defense of my father. I appreciate that gesture. But he spent a lot of time yelling. I will say in my time in the Senate, I don't believe I have ever bellowed or yelled at one of my colleagues on the Senate floor. And I hope that in my time before me that I don't ever do that. I think we should discuss issues and substance and facts and not simply scream and yell at each other. So let's go over some of the facts. In the senator from Colorado's angry speech, he did not dispute, number one, that he and every other Senate Democrat in 2013 voted for 350 miles of border wall. That's a fact. He has voted for 350 miles of border wall, as did every other Democrat in this chamber at that time. Number two, he did not dispute that in December of last year, the then Republican House of Representatives voted to fund the government, to fund the entirety of the government, and to secure the border. And the senator from Colorado, and I believe every other Democrat, filibustered that bill and caused the shutdown. Madam President, I voted to take up that bill. You voted to take up that bill. Had we taken up the bill, had we simply passed the bill, the House of Representatives had passed, funding the government and securing the border, the government would never have shut down. And so it takes some degree of uh, chutzpah to stand up after filibustering funding for the government, as the Democrats did, and to blame the shutdown on the opposing party. The senator from Colorado did not dispute the Republican House voted to fund the government, and he and his Democratic colleagues filibustered that, which caused the shutdown. And number three, the senator from Colorado did not dispute that the stated reason the Democrats filibustered that bill is because it authorized the funding of 234 miles of wall. Now, I have to say, Madam President, I find it amusing. A new adjective has creeped in. 
It's now not 234 miles of wall, it's medieval wall. I, I don't know if there's something in there that has a moat and has catapults and they're throwing burning tar. Medieval wall now. It's kind of an odd thing. It, it, it does raise the question, well, if walls are medieval, why did the senator from Colorado and every other Democrat in 2013 vote for 350 miles of medieval wall? It, it, to the extent walls are medieval, they presumably were medieval in 2013 just as much as they are now. You know, the president has a good observation. He said, I'll tell you something else that's medieval, the wheel. There's a reason the wheel is medieval, because it rolls things and it works. Walls are effective. Unlike the senator from Colorado, I live in a border state. We have 1,200 miles of border. I have spent a great deal of time down at the border with Border Patrol agents. We have miles and miles of wall right now that are working. I've been to those walls, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again. One of the rich things about this chamber is senators from states nowhere near the border presume to lecture border states about what it's like on the border and what works securing the border. Walls are effective, and I'll tell you, every single Border Patrol agent I've asked that, and I have asked dozens, probably hundreds of Border Patrol agents, are walls effective? Unquestionably, they say yes. Now, let's not, let's not construct a straw man. Walls aren't the only thing. You need technology. You need boots on the ground. You need all sorts of other tools. But walls, the critical point in intercepting someone crossing over illegally is the time between detection and interception. And what a wall does is slows down the traffickers to give the Border Patrol time to intercept them. And by the way, we've seen it over and over again in San Diego when they built the wall the illegal traffic plummeted. In El Paso, when they built the wall, the illegal traffic plummeted. But now the Democrats, their position, it's not substantive. They voted for 350 miles of wall. So why are they shutting the government down over 234 miles of wall? It's not substantive. It's political. Okay, we get they hate Donald Trump. If anyone in America had missed that point, that they really, really, really don't like this man, their yelling and screaming and bellowing has made that abundantly clear. But just because you hate somebody doesn't mean you should shut the government down. I voted to keep this government open right now today. The Democrats are filibustering funding for the government. Let me tell you something else the senator from Colorado didn't dispute. We had a whole colloquy with the senator from Louisiana, the senator from Mississippi, the senator from Alaska about funding the Coast Guard. Did you notice, Madam President, in that entire bellowing speech, the words Coast Guard were never uttered? Not once. What Senator Kennedy asked this body to do was pass a clean bill to pay the paychecks of the Coast Guard. Senator Kennedy's bill doesn't mention a wall, whether you like one or not. doesn't mention a medieval wall or any other kind of wall. It simply says, pay the Coast Guard. Yes, no. Every Republican agrees, pay the Coast Guard right now. It's not fair to treat the Coast Guard differently than we're treating the Army and Navy and Marines and Air Force. The Senator from Colorado didn't address that because it is indisputable, it is a fact that the reason that didn't pass right now is because the Democratic leader stood up and made an objection. And by implication, every Democratic senator presumably agrees with it. The fact that the senator from Colorado didn't say, yes, we should fund the Coast Guard, and you know what? My leader was wrong when he held the paychecks of the Coast Guard men and women hostage because he wants to win a political fight with the president. And by the way, I would note to the senator of Colorado, it's not the end of the world to stand up to your party's leader. Some of us have a history of having done so in the past. We're now in the longest government shutdown in history. This shutdown needs to end. The American people want it to end. But we also need to secure the border. And Madam President, I have to say the contrast between the two parties it could not be clearer. The president has repeatedly said he wants to negotiate and he wants to compromise. He said he's willing to meet in the middle. He hasn't insisted on 
every mile a border wall he asked for. He hasn't insisted on every single dollar of border security. He said, let's meet and compromise. Republicans on this side of the chamber have said, let's compromise in the middle. In the position of Senate Democrats, they will not negotiate, they will not compromise, period. So their position, how many miles of wall can be built? Zero. They're not to one yet. When it comes to negotiating, their position is not an inch of wall can be built, even though we, the Democrats, already voted for 350 miles of it. Why? Because Donald Trump's president. That is an extreme and radical position. And look, I understand folks watching at home, it's hard to tell. You're, you're reading the news. It seems like both parties are bickering. It's hard to tell what's happening, particularly because on the, on the Senate floor, there's a lot of procedural mumbo jumbo. If you want to understand what's going on, the exchange between Senator Kennedy and Senator Schumer illustrates it all. Senator Kennedy's bill did one thing and one thing only. It paid the salaries of the men and women of the Coast Guard. It didn't touch any other issue. Every Republican agrees with that bill. And the Democrats objected and said, we will not pay the Coast Guard. Had they not objected, we could put that bill on the president's desk today and they could get their paychecks right now. That is emblematic of the approach of Senate Democrats. And so, you know, when the senator from Colorado stopped screaming at me, he then engaged in a bit of historical retrospective about the great framers of our Constitution that I enjoyed and that I very much agree with. I am someone who spent a lifetime devoted to the Constitution. I am inspired by the framers who gave us this extraordinary democratic republic. And the senator from Colorado called for members of this body to aspire to be more like this men and women that gave us this country, gave us this republic if you can keep it, as Benjamin Franklin put it. And I concur with that, and what I would urge the senator from Colorado is to reach out to his democratic colleagues and counsel compromise. I am urging my colleagues on this side to do the same, and the difference is the Republicans are willing to compromise, have offered to compromise, and in fact, just now sought to pay the Coast Guard, and the Democratic position is no, 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 we object. That is partisan, it is extreme, and it is not behavior. that would bring pride to the framers of our Constitution. I hope that this body can do better. I yield the floor. President. Senator from Colorado. I, th I thank the Senator for Texas for having this conversation. I, I don't think I was yelling, but I'll go watch the tape or screaming at you. I, um, I, I also have never called anybody on this floor a liar, uh, as you did somebody in 2015 on this floor. But, and I get the theatrics of all of this. Um, but I guess I want to say two things. One, I appreciate the fact that you, at least, are, seem to be uh, accepting the fact that every Democrat who is here on that immigration bill in 2013 voted for it, voted for the 350 miles of wall that you're talking about. You didn't vote for that bill, or the senator from Texas didn't vote for that bill, and I assume you had your reasons. By the way, I wouldn't presume to think what you would think about it as a border, as a person from a border state. I say it's not far from the border. And we see the effects Ill, for ill and for good of immigration in my state. But I do know this, there were two senators from a border state, the border state of Arizona, who were on that Gang of Eight bill with whom I sat day after day after day negotiating the provisions for months. And they didn't have to just vote for that bill, I mean, or against it, but they had to go home to Arizona, John McCain and Jeff Flake did, and explain why they supported it and why it was the right thing to do for Arizona. 
which is the senator from Texas knows, is a border state. So the idea that there's a problem to be solved here because Democrats in this chamber for open borders is false, as the senator indicated. The second point is the senator from Texas referenced Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was standing outside the steps of Constitution Hall and somebody who was passing by, this was while they were writing the Constitution, said to him, Mr. Pre or, uh, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government are you creating? A monarchy or a republic? That was the question. And as, as Senator Cruz has said, his answer was a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it. His answer was not a republic. It was a republic if you can keep it. Because he knew that the words written in the Constitution weren't going to preserve themselves. That this exercise in democratic self-government, a democratic republic, would require generations of women and men, not just in this chamber, but as, a, but as citizens. And I would say as founders to keep the republic that they created. And that is what is at stake here. That is what is at stake when the government has been shut down for politics, when we have a president who doesn't believe in the rule of law, who attacks judges whose decisions he disagrees with, who attacks the free press who have that freedom because of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It's that republic that's at risk when we're not educating the next generation of Americans, when we're not investing in our infrastructure. When we have the unbelievable and unprecedented fiscal hypocrisy that has resulted in a ballooning deficit while the unemployment rate is going down, it's a farce. It is a farce. And so my closing words is to say I will work with anybody, including the senator from Texas, if he would work with me, to put this sorry episode behind us. And I don't mean this sorry episode, this government shutdown, although that is a sorry and pathetic episode. But this episode of American political history where we've done so little for the next generation of Americans and done almost nothing to honor the legacy of our parents and grandparents and the people that came before them. That would be worth doing before we all die around this place. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor.